Ottoman society and rule is not only controversial among Orthodox Christians, but also among Turks as well as Arabs. There is a lot of prejudice, a lot of made-up nonsense, misquotes, but also a lot of very twisted professional opinions. Hence, I wanted to know more about the society in which Arabs and Turks live together in by reading the book The Arabs of the Ottoman Empire 1516-1918 to by Bruce Masters. And before I can start the topic, the video has to come with several disclaimer for several reasons. First, records of Islamic courts in Arab cities and cancellary documents relating to Arabs are located mostly in Istanbul and are only slowly emerging for research purposes. This was stated by the author who published his book in 2013. Second, there is very few literature attempting to replicate a broad overarching survey of the region's history with respect to Ottoman rule. As an example, Arab historic research is understandably more focused on Arabic history rather than Turkish history. This does not mean that there is no research. Egypt and the Fertile Crescent, 1616 to 1922, a political history by P.M. Holt, or The Arabs and the Ottomans by Al Arab Wa Al Utmayun in 1976, are two broader works, but the number of such research is very few and far in between. Third and lastly, how well the respective Ottoman governors did their job and to what degree is a subject that yet has to be fully explored. I don't think there is a lot of new work done between the publishing of this book and the current state of research with respect to the topic. But why is this topic even relevant? From the Turkish perspective, it's important to understand how our ancestors ruled Arabs in order to comprehend our neighbors' feelings and to prevent fascist and racist nonsense along the lines of the Arabs just betrayed us. This shall hopefully become more clear by the end of the video. From the Arabic perspective, it's important to understand what the facts are and or where in order to prevent nationalistic vigor from overtaking emotions and judgments. It's essential for both sides to understand the facts, not only for a better coexistence, but also for the greater good of the region. Something the region surprisingly lacks in the 21st century. This is sad, to be honest. So let's start with the Arabic nationalistic self-view on how the Arabs were governed by Turks. The Europeans started their new life in the 15th century, while the Arabs were delayed by the Ottomans until the 19th century. This is paraphrased, but said by Taha Hussein. I can't speak about this impact as an Egyptian historian, but this type of sentiment was rather popular among at least the significant part of the intellectual Arabic circles, but also among older Arabs of the 1970s. Zulm al-Turk, oppression of the Turks in English, was at least a popular saying, and in general the Ottoman period was seen as a period of stagnation. In particular, in Iraq, the Ottoman reign was, or maybe still is, received as a period with no development. However, even though Zulm al-Turk is or was a popular saying, the full quote, or the full saying goes, Zulm al-Turk, wala adil al-Arab, the oppression of Turks is better than Bedouin justice. And just like the quote, facts are regularly distorted with respect to the Ottoman topic. So let's start with Selim I, the founder of the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottomans were a regional power prior, Selim I elevated the Ottomans to an empire by beating two rival empires, the Safavids and the Mamluks, within eight years. Most of the territory he conquered would stay under Ottoman sovereignty for at least three to four centuries to come. Selim's conquest wasn't just a campaign of conquest, but also a campaign of diplomacy. His march into Syria was accompanied with the Syrian governors switching sides to the Ottomans, whereas the conquest of Egypt brought the end of the Mamluk state, but not of the Mamluks. The Mamluk elite still existed alongside other groups up until the early 19th century, where they even fought against Napoleon, but this time to protect their land in the name of the Ottomans. At first, the Arabs perceived themselves as occupied people and depicted the Ottomans as foreigners, but with familiar elements, aka Islam. The Ottoman Turks were referred as Rumi, most likely as a reference to the Romans or Roman lands the Ottomans were controlling, and even though Ottoman Turks were foreign to Egypt, Turks were not. During the first century of the Mamluk Sultanate, most slaves that arrived in Cairo were Turkic-speaking people. 
So for the local Arabs, the entire campaign looked like the switching from one Turkic rule to another. However, three main changes were observed by the local Arabs. First, the economic prosperity, similarity and legislative. Second, the impact of Arabs on the survival of the empire itself. Third, the lack of change by the Ottoman state. Selim's reign ended quickly with his untimely death. He only had one son, Suleiman I. People were unsure what changes Suleiman would bring or if he would even be a good ruler. But luckily for his subjects, he did not only live long but went into history as Kanuni, the lawmaker. Reforming Ottoman law and reigning with justice, Suleiman brought an entire era of internal stability, economic prosperity and uphold justice. The 16th century went into history as the golden age of the Ottomans. The golden century. For the Arabs, this meant an Ottoman state structure that was invested in Islamic notions, which appealed to Arab traditions and worldview. Arab peasants were protected from abuse and especially from inter-regional raids conducted by groups on one or the other side. As an example, the disappearance of the border around the Euphrates also meant the appearance of economic stability and prosperity. Guilds were formed. They may or may not have existed under the Mamluks, but Ottoman reign proliferated the formation of guilds, making guilds into an integral part of Ottoman economy. Not only that, the Ottomans funded madrasas across the realm. As an example, Suleiman ordered Mimar Sinan to design one in Damascus in 1554. The Grand Vizier and former governor of Aleppo, Nusref Pasha, built one in 1546. Madrasas were not just an Islam-affiliated building, they were essentially schools educating people. Some of these madrasas had state-sponsored curriculums, but mostly these institutions in Arab lands were only state-sponsored with various Arabic elites deciding the curry column, which for instance included Persian literature. Hence, Arab cultural literature continued throughout the Ottoman period. Furthermore, these schools acted as interdisciplinary and interregional exchange centers with scholars debating and corresponding between each other. For most Arabic-speaking people, it became apparent that the Ottomans were not alien but that the Ottomans stood on common ground with shared values. The spirit of prosperity formed a strong bond to the point that some scholars, some Arabic scholars, were bothered by the lack of pedigree of the Ottoman house, such as Maria al Karmi in 1624, claiming that Osman Ghazi was of the lineage of the Caliph Uthman. In case you're wondering what the line of augmentation was, Uthman in Turkish is Osman, so same name, same lineage. Makes sense, right? This may sound random, but Arabs are, or at least were, proud of their own lineage, which is why this is meant to be understood as an attempt to further underline Ottoman legitimacy. Of course, there was some Ottoman propaganda as well. Ottoman court historians popularized the claim that the last Abbasid caliph in Cairo, al-Mutawakil, bestowed his clock on Selim, meaning handing over the caliphate, but no such records exist. Lastly, the Ottomans broke through the Portuguese blockade of the Indian Ocean and revived maritime trade to India and Southeast Asia, from which Arab cities profited from. Not only that, the Ottomans also fended off the Spanish invasion into the Maghreb, as well as Christian attacks on Muslim ships. Either way, it wasn't just a new gain of stability and prosperity that deepened Ottoman-Arab relations. It was also the impact Arabs had on the empire itself. As mentioned, one big aspect for Arab loyalty was the lack of interference in education. So the Arab ulama was simplified. The Arab religious elite was very keen on Ottoman rule and understood that they played a crucial role in the stability and survival of the empire. They would groom their own religious people and have a saying in the legitimacy of Ottoman rule. As an example, pedigree was very important and most likely still is very important in Arab politics meaning relations to the family of the Prophet comes with more legitimacy. The Moroccan royalty has a lineage to the Prophet. The Ottomans didn't. So you would expect that Arabs would welcome the fall of the Ottomans, but that's not what happened. The Moroccan dynasty was factually seen as more legitimate in the eyes of some, but the Ottomans were accepted as rightly guided caliphs. 
Let's put the Ottoman dynasty a step below the Rashidin Caliphate, but very close to it nonetheless. The Ottoman dynasty, so Arab scholars, were seen as worthy rulers. The line of argumentation here was that the Caliphate was simply not transferable, hence the Ottomans as protectors of the Islamic world may not have been equal to the Caliphate, but still seen in high regards. Ibrahim al kiyari of Medina, as an example, went as far as writing poems praising Sultan Selim in 1672. He also praised Sultan Mehmed IV for the conquest of Crete in 1669. Friday prayers for the ruling Ottoman Sultan in mosques, in Arabic mosques, were relatively speaking common occurrence. Additionally, even though the Ottomans were Sunni, Shia practices were tolerated. They may not have been acknowledged nor denied their truth but it ensured the loyalty of Shia Arabs or Shia people in general. Furthermore, the Ottomans would employ local Arabs for defending trade routes from Bedouin raids. The Ottoman cavalry was simply no match to Bedouin camels in the desert, which continued to be the case until breech-loading rifles were developed in the 19th century. Finally, the lack of Ottoman interference in Arab lands was an additional factor which helped to govern Arab lands. For starters, Arabs were exempt from military service. The Ottoman army consisted of Anatolian and Balkan troops. This stood the test of time until reforms were conducted in the 19th century. The Ottomans would assign governors to the respective Arab provinces to collect a set amount of taxes, but aside from that, the local elites were free to work the way they wanted. Of course, the impact of the governor changed from province to province. The Levant, as an example, was more directly controlled, whereas Hejaz was left to the Hashemites to protect, while Egypt had its Mamluk elite. However, this also meant that in faraway provinces, governors or the local elite could generate more revenue, take a larger cut from the profit, and only give the Ottoman dynasty the great amount of taxes. The taxes were not percentage-based. So all in all, at least in the first one to two centuries, the Arabs were more than happy with Ottoman rule. Ottoman rule protected Islamic territory, expanded the Islamic realm, revitalized trade, brought prosperity, gave free reign with respect to education, codified law, protected various areas from Christian invasion, for most in the Maghreb region. Arabs were involved in the Ottoman state structure to the point that the Arab ulama considered the Ottoman realm as theirs while acknowledging the differences. In short, there was not much to complain about, especially with the lack of an alternative for Ottoman might, prestige and rule. But how did the Ottomans rule? 